So on my workbench today, I have a Techniques SLB10 belt drive turntable. So I bought this at a thrift store for $20, and it has some obvious problems and probably some ones that are not so obvious. So starting with the lid, the front of the lid looks pretty much okay, but the back definitely is not okay. So it's cracked, and where the hinges actually the parts that go into the hinges are, those have actually snapped off. So again, it is belt drive, it has a decent platter mat, but the belt is in there, but clearly past it. So it is a P-mount turntable with an intact cartridge, so that's good. Actually, the tone arm rest is intact too, that's good also. So on the back, it's missing all of the cables, the RCAs, the ground, and the power cable. And this is kind of interesting. So the P-mount standard normally has a fixed tracking weight of 1.25 grams, but this is actually slightly adjustable between 1 and 1 1.5, I guess, to account for variability between cartridges. So that's actually a nice feature. So the first question really is, does the motor work? And if it does, then other aspects of it are probably worth fixing. So this threw me for a loop for a moment. So most techniques turntables, this button would be the start stop button, but this is a fully manual turntable. So it doesn't do that. It's actually a power button. So I'm gonna press this and we have movement, but the motor sounds terrible. So I also tried the queuing function, and so far, literally nothing on this turntable works. So on the bottom, the screws to remove the base are all in red. So I'm going to start by removing the motor by removing these three screws. So there's the motor, so it looks like this bracket is removed by removing these two screws from the other side. Okay. Still doesn't want to come off. Oop, there we go. So there's a rubber encasement over the motor here, but there's no other screws to remove it. It looks like to remove the motor, it's actually just soldered in on the bottom. So I managed to pry off the rubber casing, which hasn't revealed a whole lot. I put some oil in there and the motor spins freely but still sounds terrible. So I would guess that the these two points here are what hold the motor in. So I'm going to try unsoldering those. Yep, in addition to providing an electrical connection, they actually held the motor in in this orientation. So there are these metal tabs around the plastic base of the motor, and I think if I bend them out, I'll be able to pull this bottom plastic part off. So I've made it this far on my own, but now I was kind of stumped as to what the actual problem with this motor was. So I did some searching and found this excellent video by Rondo1234560. So the motor on his turntable, while it was not exactly the same turntable, had exactly the same problem. It was a broken plastic piece inside that was rattling around and required that that piece be taken off and the magnet re-glued to the motor. So I would suggest that you just go over to his video on YouTube, which I'll link in the description, follow the instructions there, and then come back here and see how I made out with it. So it's not as bad as the one he showed, but it's definitely the same issue. So this retaining ring that goes around the magnet is definitely broken. It hasn't broken off yet, but I would imagine that's what's responsible for the noise. So basically finished the job, snapped off that outer ring and removed the magnet. I'm gonna clean this up with isopropyl alcohol and prepare to glue it. So I'm just gonna use some liquid super glue to glue the magnet in place. I don't have the same adhesive that he does. So I'm going to reassemble the motor with some lubrication in this little bearing and on the end of here. And I think as far as lubrication on the top is concerned, probably again the best thing is just to drip it in around the spindle. 
So I have snapped the motor back together. It feels much better. It sounds good too. So I'm going to solder it back in. So this little window here goes over this chip, which is actually a speed sensor. And the motor runs quietly. And all these parts that don't work are just covered with gunk and hair. So I'm going to clean these up. So these parts cleaned up very well. I actually ended up taking most of this apart to clean it thoroughly with WD-40 and isopropyl alcohol. But I really don't feel like it has to be lubricated at all. These parts move perfectly freely without any grease on them. And the grease seems like it's just going to cause trouble in the long run. So I think I'm going to leave it as is. This is obviously not good. So I'm going to have to take off this plate here with these screws that are around the perimeter. So it looks like this plastic piece has a screw here. It's supposed to be clamped onto the spindle and this felt brake rubs against the edge of it. But the question is where on that spindle should this go? And unfortunately, as I tried to tighten that screw up, a crack appeared here. I don't know if it was cracked before, if it just cracked now, but that is going to keep it from clamping on. So I've gotten it apart and I removed the screw and the nut so as not to contaminate them, but I'm going to try super gluing that together, clamping it, hope for the best. So the glue is dry and it looks like it's held pretty well, but I really don't know where to attach this. So the tone arm is in the rest right now, so it's basically in this direction, like here. So as it pivots, it's going to go like this, okay? And this is going to move in this direction. So I assume that this should be in the arc that would attach, that would touch this felt pad here. But the service manual was of no help here, so let's see what happens. So I also reattached the spring here, and this is actually the anti-scape mechanism. So this is the first P-mount turntable I've seen that actually has fully adjustable anti-scape, which again is pretty unusual. So while I think I fix it, I'm still not entirely sure what this wedged shaped piece actually does. So there's a felt pad down here. So when I operate the cueing mechanism, the felt pad is going to move and touch the wedge. So that's with the tone arm uh, in the up position. And then when I lower it, it's gonna gradually move away. So I'm not really sure what this is supposed to do. Provide some drag on the arm as you're moving it into position maybe? I don't know. Now the position of it might affect the calibration of the anti-skate because the anti-skate spring is attached to it, but it seems to work, so I don't know. I'm going to service the central bearing by taking out these two screws here. This could definitely use a cleaning. So I reattached that bottom bracket and put some black molybdenum grease on that little pivot point there. So it does turn and rub against that as the platter turns. So I've also dripped oil around the spindle here. It's been kind of dirty, so I've been putting it in, cleaning it off, putting it in, cleaning it off. So it's pretty clean now. And the platter spins pretty well. So I removed the P-mount cartridge to inspect the stylus, and there is none. So I managed to find an original Audio-Technica elliptical stylus for this P-mount cartridge. And they're pretty hard to come by now. So this particular one, again, is a genuine model, and it is green. But if we look at this cartridge, so I have basically two of the same cartridge. It also has a green stylus on it but this is not a genuine stylus. So for the P-mount standard, it's very important that whatever stylus that you have, whether it's conical or elliptical, tracks properly and sounds good at 1.25 grams tracking weight. And this one should fit the bill, but this one most certainly does not. So this is a cheap aftermarket stylus, and this has a conical tip on it, 
even though it's green, which would suggest it's the same as this one, it most certainly is not. So while this cartridge sounds okay if it tracks at two grams or above, it definitely does not sound okay at 1.25. So that's why I fitted a genuine stylus. I think it was worth the investment. So I have it tracking at just about the P-mount standard of 1.25 grams, but to get there, I actually had to adjust this so it was off. So it's set lower, closer to one gram than 1.25, as illustrated on the scale. So although I cleaned up the front end of the queuing mechanism, the switch up here, the back end seems to not be working at all. So I'm gonna start by removing this screw right here. So I think that's an adjustment screw, but I have it moving very, very stiffly. So I think to try to free it up, I'm gonna squirt some WD-40 down in there. It won't hurt anything and it might dissolve whatever grease is holding them up. So that helped almost immediately. So it will go down on its own and is actually responding to the queuing level here. So I think there's a ways to go, but that's definitely an improvement. So you can see where the plunger and spring are on the bottom. So I'm gonna squirt some WD-40 in there as well. I was able to work it enough to actually get the plastic part out and give that a nice cleanup and also put some more lubricant there in the top to loosen this up. So in addition to attaching this tone arm rest, this screw in it also adjusts the height of it and therefore the height of the tone arm at rest. So if you look at it where it is now, the cueing is down, but the tone arm is not all the way down on the tone arm rest. So I'm going to screw this clockwise which is going to make it go further down. And as I do that, the tone arm is going to go down. I'm going to keep turning it until it is at rest. So there's a lot of residue from the old belt on the platter. I'm going to clean that with Goo Gone. So I installed a new belt to check the speed using the built-in strobe. So I'm going to adjust the pitch knob so that the little lines are not moving to the left or the right. This is for 33 speed. And this is settling down, but there is some room for improvement, I think. The speed was fairly stable, but I'm gonna clean up these speed controls anyway by taking out these screws. give this a nice cleanup, but I'm also going to clean the potentiometer. So I'm going to squirt some deoxit fader lube into here and then work it around. This can deal with some speed stability issues. So on the motor board there are two variable resistors labeled VR1 and VR2. So VR1 is for 45, VR2 for 33. So I'm going to center the knob that's on top of the turntable and then adjust these so that the speed is approximately correct. So that will give me the greatest range of motion for that control on top. So what is the range of motion here? If I put my finger here, one, two, three, and a half or so. So if I go back one, and a half, and just a little bit more. That should be about centered. So you can adjust those speed controls from below while the turntable is running, but to be honest, it's pretty awkward. So another way to do it is from the top. So the holes actually go straight through the plinth here. You can adjust them from up here. So this one on the left, this is the 45, and this is the 33. So of course you do have to stop the platter and lift the mat to adjust these, but I think it's easier than getting in from below. So I'm going to power it up. So this turntable is so simple that it doesn't even have a switch to turn the motor off when you move the tone arm back to the rest. You just power it up with this, and 
have it set to 45 currently. So Techniques normally recommends that you start with the 45 speed and then go to the 33. And since this has a built-in strobe, we might as well use this. So you can see this row of dots there should be stationary, but it's marching a little bit to the left. So I'm going to stop the platter. So this is just a flat blade screwdriver. I'll stick it in the hole. And I'm going to turn it a little bit counterclockwise. Okay, I think I have this pretty good now for 45. So those VR1 and VR2 variable resistors are not intended for fine adjustments. That's what this is here for. But if you get it just about right with them, then you can make up the difference here. So I'm finished with 45. I'm going to switch to 33 and do the same. So this turntable did not come with any cables, which wasn't such a big deal. I actually had a power cable that fit it. These are just standard RCA cables. And in the past, when I had a table like this, the ground cable, what fit perfectly was a banana plug from a speaker terminal. But as it turns out, this one is different and that did not work. So what I did is I took something that's called a, a pin ferrule. So these are meant to be uh, crimped onto a wire. I didn't want to crimp it, I wanted it to stay round. So I soldered a wire to the inside of it and this fits pretty well into this hole. And then there's the question of the lid. So there's obviously two problems. So the first one is that the hinges are broken. So this is the hinge that fits into the turntable base. I just removed it to clean it. But the tab that comes off of the lid here that goes into this notch is broken off. And this is a very common problem with Techniques turntables. And this is actually the easier of the two problems to fix. So there are repair kits that are widely available for Techniques hinges. This one is on Amazon, there's many on eBay, and they're pretty inexpensive too. So basically what it involves is cutting or grinding off what remains of the tab on the turntable lid and drilling holes and screwing these metal pieces to the lid, which then provides a very solid tab to insert into the hinges on the turntable base. So this, however, will only work if you have something solid to screw the hinge parts to. So I think the bigger problem is that even if I were to do that fix, what it would be screwing into is not very stable here. So it's cracked right around the hinge area. So one idea that I had was to basically glue another piece of plastic either to the outside of this or to the inside of it. I thought maybe I could paint it black to hide the cracks. It would look pretty good looking from the other side. But the problem is if I stick something else on the outside of this to make it thicker, when I put those hinge repair adapters on, it will be skewed the wrong way on both sides. So if I try to put something on the inside though, if we look, there's actually not a whole lot of clearance here between this uh, piece of the plinth right here and the back of the lid. So I'm not sure if either one of those methods would work with this turntable. So obviously the best solution would be to buy a turntable that has an intact lid, but that's not what I did. So I think that's about it for this Techniques SLB10 turntable. So it certainly had a few surprises in the store. So I didn't know what to do about the noisy motor until I found that video from Rondo1234560. His procedures were exactly what I needed and fixed the problem perfectly. So thanks for that. So also with a new belt and some tweaks, the speed is very stable now. I replaced the stylus with a genuine Audio-Technica elliptical one and the turntable really sounds terrific. So I've fixed some problems with the tone arm, fixing that problem with the wedge, still not quite sure what it does, and cleaning up the damping. So just cleaning it out seemed to have helped enough, didn't have to add any more damping fluid. So for a 43-year-old basic turntable, I think this is pretty nice. So obviously what lets it down is the lid. So until I figure out exactly what to do with that, I'm gonna hold off. So I think that I might make another video if I can figure out a solution. 
but for now I'm pretty satisfied with how this has turned out, and once again, thanks for listening.